Portland, Oregon. One of those quiet evenings when the city has already fallen into a soft darkness, but at a home on Broadway Street, life ended tragically. Police received the call around 10.15 p.m. A male voice, calm and devoid of emotion, reported two bodies in the house. When patrol officers arrived on the scene, they were greeted by a gruesome scene. Two bodies lay in the luxurious living room, flooded by the light of street lamps. A woman and a man. Blood mixed with broken shards of glasses formed patterns on the dark parquet. Detective Sarah Miller was the first to arrive on the scene. She walked through the front door, which was ajar. As she entered the house, she immediately smelled the metallic tang of blood in the air. Her professional instincts told her this was no simple assault. On the floor by the fireplace lay a woman with a rounded belly, pregnant. Her face was frozen in an expression of horror, and her arms showed cuts and bruises, signs that she had tried to defend herself. The woman, identified as Julia Hills, 34, had been stabbed multiple times in the chest and abdomen area. These wounds were inflicted with force, and it was obvious from the location of the blows that the killer was deliberately aiming for her abdomen, where new life was developing. The blows were delivered chaotically, but each one was aimed with a fury that spoke of strong emotions, anger, and hatred. Bloodstains on her hands and cuts on her fingers indicated that Julia had tried to defend herself by grabbing the knife. Next to her, face down, lay a man in a white coat. His body was soaked with blood, and a medical kit was lying next to him. Sarah knew immediately. This was a doctor. The officers who were examining the room confirmed her hunch. It was doctor. Leonard Henley, 42, a well-known private healer in Portland to whom many families turned. He was someone who helped couples in desperate situations when traditional medicine had given up on them. But what was he doing here in the Hills' home? And why did he turn up dead? Dr. Henley was killed with one precise stab to the heart area. The blow was so precise that death was instantaneous. His arms were folded beneath his body, and his medical coat was covered with bloodstains. An expression of shock froze on his face, indicating that he hadn't expected the attack. Unlike Julia, there were no signs of struggle on his arms. He didn't even have time to raise his hands to defend himself. Forensics soon began a thorough examination of the scene. On the coffee table in the living room were two glasses, one of which was cracked. There were remnants of red wine in one of the glasses, and forensics showed traces of a sedative drug. This discovery added to the intrigue. Who had spiked the sedative and why? Someone was probably trying to sedate or sedate the victims before committing the attack. These details, along with the condition of the bodies, confirmed one thing. This was no random act of violence. This was a planned crime, an elaborate crime. Julia and Dr. Henley were killed with a rage that did not come from a bystander. The evidence pointed to the killer's personal involvement and emotional involvement. While the detectives were gathering evidence, they decided to check the personal effects of Julia's husband, Robert Hills, who incidentally had gone missing. They found a disguised safe in his closet. Detectives requested an autopsy warrant. When they opened the safe, they found photos and documents indicating Julia was being followed. The photos showed her with Leonard in various locations, a coffee shop, a park, the Portland waterfront. Their poses were not just friendly, they were holding hands and exchanging looks full of tenderness. This confirmed the detective's suspicions. There was a connection between Julia and the doctor, which Robert uncovered. Meanwhile, forensic investigators reviewed camera footage in the neighborhood and confirmed that Robert was in the house that evening. The officers began to realize that the killer was most likely him, a husband who, upon learning of the affair, had come home with the intention of ending the betrayal. The task now was to find Robert and find out all the details of his involvement. Three days had passed since the double murder at the Hills' home, but the investigation continued to bog down. Robert Hills, who was still on the wanted list, did not make himself known, and detectives Sarah Miller and James Carter were increasingly inclined to believe that he was not just a witness, but the main suspect. They realized that to solve this mystery, they needed to dig deeper into his life and understand what exactly could have been the catalyst for the tragedy. The detectives began by examining Robert's financial and phone records. Over the past month, he had made several large transactions, transferring money to unknown offshore accounts. These transactions seemed suspicious, 
and Carter suspected they might be related to his plans to abscond. Moreover, Robert often called a number registered to a private investigator named Ray Bradley. Carter and Miller decided to find out what Robert's connection to Bradley was, and why the latter was hiring him. Ray Bradley, a graying middle-aged man with tired eyes, met the detectives in his small office on the outskirts of town. At first he claimed he knew nothing about Robert Hills, and that all their meetings had been business related to the restaurant business. But when Carter pressed, showing phone records, Bradley confessed Robert had hired him months before the murder. He suspected his wife Julia was cheating on him and wanted proof. Bradley showed the detectives photographs he had taken over the past few months. The pictures showed Julia with Dr. Leonard Henley. Their encounters looked decidedly more intimate than they might have been between patient and doctor. They met in cafes, the park, even at Julia's house when Robert wasn't around. The detectives realized that Robert knew about his wife's affair, and that was probably the reason for his disappearance. Miller felt this was an important twist in the investigation. They searched the Bradley home and found even more evidence, a hidden camera video of Julia and Dr. Henley clearly showing affectionate feelings for each other. This footage could explain Robert's motive if he had indeed witnessed the affair and decided to act. Meanwhile, lab experts finished analyzing the blood and fingerprints found at the crime scene. Prints belonging to Robert were found on the kitchen table and the doorknob. And it's likely that Robert may have put a powerful drug in the drink to weaken Julia and Dr. Henley before the attack. Detectives also examined Julia's phone records. It was clear in her last messages to Dr. Henley that she feared for her safety. She wrote that Robert was becoming increasingly suspicious and that she felt he was watching her. The last message, sent an hour before the murder, asked him to come to her home to discuss something important. Detectives began to realize that Julia suspected that Robert had found out about her affair and that she was in danger. Everything indicated that the murder had been planned and executed in a fit of rage. The detectives returned to the Hills' home to look around again. They looked for any details that might confirm that Robert had planned his crime in advance. In Robert's office, they found paper traces of his correspondences with Detective Bradley and his calculations, the routes he had studied to sneak out of town. Carter and Miller decided they needed to focus on finding Robert's car to see where he might have gone after the murder. The patrol team soon found Robert's car on one of the quiet streets on the outskirts of Portland, next to an abandoned warehouse. The car was locked, but there were no visible signs of a struggle. Detectives checked the location and noticed the warehouse doors were ajar. Inside, they found several boxes of Robert's papers and personal effects, all indicating that he had planned his disappearance in advance. But the trail went cold, and the case remained a mystery. While the forensics team processed the car, Carter and Miller went back to Robert's financial transactions. They discovered that in the days before the murder, he had withdrawn a substantial amount of cash and rented a house on the Oregon coast. Detectives immediately dispatched a patrol unit to the rental address. When they arrived, the house was empty, but signs pointed to a recent presence. Fresh tire tracks in the driveway and food in the refrigerator left no more than a couple of days before. Detectives also found Robert's laptop in the house, which he had left on. It had a page open with instructions on how to change his appearance and a request for fake IDs. Carter and Miller began to realize. Robert had planned to hide for a long time, and perhaps his disappearance was part of an elaborate plan. But how far was he willing to go? In parallel, Sarah Miller continued to study Robert's correspondence. She discovered that he frequently exchanged messages with a certain Jake who was helping him organize his escape. Miller decided to seek a warrant to trace this contact. Her hunch was confirmed. Jake was a fake name for someone associated with an underground network involved in document forgery and hiding assistance. It indicated that Robert wasn't alone. He had helpers. Meanwhile, detectives received the results of the fingerprint analysis at the crime scene. In addition to Robert's footprints, additional footprints were found that did not belong to either Julia or Dr. Henley. These footprints led to an interesting revelation. They matched the fingerprints of Detective Bradley, who claimed not to have been in the house that night. This revelation alarmed Carter and Miller. Detectives called Bradley in for questioning and showed him the test results. He tried to justify himself, claiming that he had been in the house earlier when he was gathering evidence for Robert. 
but his explanations seemed unconvincing, and Carter began to suspect that Bradley was more than just an outside observer. Perhaps he was involved in the murder, or knew more than he was telling. While the investigation was underway, detectives also obtained information about a recording of a call police received the night of the crime. Forensics confirmed that the call was indeed made from Robert's cell phone. The caller claimed to have found the bodies, but the recording lacked emotion. The voice was calm and composed. Carter noted that such an approach would be odd for a man who had just discovered the bodies of his wife and her lover. It made him wonder if Robert, by calling the police, was trying to deflect suspicion away from himself and make it look as if he had accidentally witnessed it. But then where and why had he disappeared to? But as we already know, Robert was involved in this bloody crime. Detectives became increasingly convinced that Robert was the key figure in the whole affair. But the questions remained. Where had he fled to, and what was his ultimate goal? Was it a spontaneous crime, or a premeditated murder that had been planned down to the smallest detail? Two weeks had passed since the crime and the Robert Hills investigation was still in the spotlight. Detectives, Sarah Miller and James Carter realized that the more time that passed, the harder it would be to find Robert and uncover all the details of the crime. They decided to delve into his personal life to understand what exactly caused his behavior. The first serious clues appeared after analyzing the correspondence found on Robert's laptop. It contained an exchange of messages with private investigator Ray Bradley, whom Robert had hired a few months ago. In the emails, Robert expressed suspicions about his wife, Julia, and asked to gather evidence of her infidelity. There was no rage in the messages, but a sense of deep resentment and frustration. Carter and Miller knew that this personal motive could have been the catalyst for a violent crime. They called Ray Bradley back in for questioning. Bradley confirmed that Robert had hired him to spy on his wife. Bradley collected a lot of evidence, including photographs and videos of Julia meeting with Dr. Leonard Henley. This material became an important part of the investigation, confirming that Robert knew of the affair and was convinced of his wife's betrayal. Detectives examined photographs provided by Bradley. The photos showed Julia and Leonard in cafes, parks, and even outside the house when Robert was at work. Their poses, looks, and gestures left no doubt. There was a connection between them that went beyond a professional relationship. For Robert, who trusted his wife, and who was pregnant, it was a betrayal he could not forgive. In parallel, forensic experts finished analyzing the traces at the crime scene. The fingerprints on one of the glasses found in the house belonged to Robert. There were also traces of a sedative on the glass, which supported the detective's theory. Robert had probably put the substance in the drink to weaken or sedate Julia and Dr. Henley before the attack. This indicated that the crime had been carefully planned. Carter and Miller continued to examine surveillance footage in the neighborhood of the Hills' home. They were able to track Robert's car pulling up to the house an hour before the murder. He entered the house and, according to the footage, didn't come out until 45 minutes later, quickly getting into his car and driving away. Robert's face was hidden by a hood, but his movements and build matched his profile. This confirmed that he was in the house at the time of the murder. Sarah Miller and James Carter decided to search the Hills house again, hoping to find something else that might confirm their hunch. During their examination, they discovered a small disguised flash drive hidden in a cabinet in Robert's study. On the flash drive, they found video files recorded by a hidden camera that Bradley had installed in the bedroom. One of the recordings showed Julia and Doctor, Henley hugging and kissing, unaware of the surveillance. This evidence explained everything. Robert not only knew about the affair, but had seen it with his own eyes. The detectives realized that Robert had probably been watching them for a long time before deciding to commit the crime. He had gathered enough evidence to be convinced of the affair, and that was the final straw. But one thing remained. Where had he fled to after the murder? A couple days later, the investigation decided to go back to Private Detective Bradley and ask him some more questions. This time, they were more persistent. Bradley confirmed that Robert was convinced that his wife had cheated on him and was under a lot of emotional stress. He recounted how Robert became increasingly withdrawn and angry when he saw evidence of her betrayal. Bradley, however, insisted that he did not know Robert was planning to kill them both and that his role was limited to gathering information. The detectives believed Bradley but kept him under surveillance anyway, fearing that he might know more than he was saying. 
They also went back to checking Robert's phone records to see who he might have been communicating with before his disappearance. One number that came up frequently in the calls was a contact named Jake. This was the same person who had helped him with his escape. Miller and Carter recognized that Jake might be in the Lincoln City area and sent a team of operatives there. They located a house associated with the contact and began surveillance. A few days later, they noticed a man matching Robert's description enter the house. This was confirmation that they were on the right track. The operatives found that the house was being prepared for going out on the water. Jerry cans of fuel, a supply of food and tools to prepare the boat were seen. Everything indicated that Robert was planning to take advantage of his last chance to escape. But all of this only added to the questions. Robert knew he was being followed. Did he have some kind of more elaborate plan? What would be his next move? And how far would he be willing to go to get away with it? Operatives and detectives, Sarah Miller and James Carter, focused their surveillance on the Lincoln City home that Robert Hills was using as a safe house. All indications were that he was preparing for a waterborne escape. Police set up a perimeter around the neighborhood and prepared for a capture operation. Carter and Miller personally led the operation, realizing that this was their chance to capture Robert before he disappeared forever. They prepared several task forces, positioning them at the main exits and along the coast. The goal was simple keep Robert out, and finally get answers. As night fell, the detectives watched the lights come on in the house. A man matching Robert's description began stowing things in the boat. Miller noticed that he acted quickly and methodically, checking every detail before finally launching the boat. Carter gave the command to prepare, but not to begin the assault until Robert had moved far enough away from the house to deny him the opportunity to return and barricade himself. As Robert headed toward the boat, Carter gave the command to move. Within seconds, the operatives had the house and pier surrounded. Robert, noticing the movement, rushed toward the boat, but was blocked. He was holding a small revolver, which made things difficult. Detectives and operatives knew that any mistake could lead to tragedy. Drop the gun, Robert! You're surrounded! shouted Miller, keeping the gun pointed at him. Robert stopped, looking at the detectives. His eyes read a mixture of rage and despair. He realized he had little chance of getting away, but instead of obeying, he swung around and threw the fuel canister toward the operatives to distract their attention. Then he jumped into the boat and started the motor. Carter and Miller gave the command to fire on the engine, and several shots were fired. But Robert managed to pull away from the shore and began to move away. However, it soon became clear that one of the shots had damaged the engine and the boat began to slow down. The operatives immediately set off after him in another boat, and within minutes they caught up with Robert. As they approached, Robert attempted to jump overboard, but was caught and pulled onto the deck. He was handcuffed and taken to shore, where Carter and Miller personally interrogated him on the spot. You knew we'd find you, Carter said, looking him in the eye. Robert, breathing heavily, stared at the detectives. He didn't say a word but the look in his eyes said that he no longer saw any point in resisting. Soon, he was taken to the station, where the interrogation began in earnest. During the interrogation, Robert gradually began to tell his version of events. He confessed that a few months before the murder he had hired a private detective to follow Julia. His suspicions were confirmed. He learned that she was cheating on him with Dr. Leonard Henley. He described how every time he saw evidence of their encounters, rage built up in him more and more. Robert said that on the night of the murder he came home earlier than usual and found the two of them together. He had put a sedative in the wine beforehand, knowing that Julia and Henley would drink it when they were alone together. Even though Julia was pregnant, she did not deny herself the pleasure and occasionally drank her favorite wine in small quantities in the company of her lover. The plan was simple, weaken them and then finish them off to punish them for their betrayal. He described how he first approached Julia, who tried to defend herself but was too weakened to offer serious resistance. His blows were purposeful and brutal, and each one was aimed at the abdomen, where new life was developing. For him, it wasn't just killing his wife, it was destroying everything he believed to be false, since Julia was pregnant not by him, but by Henley. It turns out that after years of failed attempts to conceive and ineffective visits to traditional doctors, Julia began looking for alternative treatments. That's how she met Dr. Leonard Henley, 
a specialist in alternative medicine who offered innovative approaches to infertility treatment. Initially, Julia turned to him for help, hoping that he could offer a solution to her problem. The doctor prescribed her certain drugs, vitamins, and special herbs, and it worked. Julia was able to get pregnant, but not from her husband, but from her doctor, but carefully hid it, and perhaps she did not even know about it, as Robert found out that he is infertile and cannot have children, so the problem was not in Julia and in him. Over time, Julia and Henley's meetings became more frequent, and the relationship went beyond professional. Julia, feeling lonely and unhappy in her marriage to Robert, found comfort in Henley's care and attention. Back to the crime. When Robert finished with Julia, he turned to Henley. The doctor, who realized what was happening, tried to defend himself. But Robert stabbed him in the heart, knowing it would stop him instantly. Robert described it with equanimity, as if it was an inevitable finale. But there was still a desperation creeping into his words. He realized he'd gone too far but he was sure it was the only way to get revenge. Carter and Miller asked why he had called the police after the crime. Robert explained that he wanted to make it look like he'd just discovered the bodies and tried to help to deflect suspicion, but realized that no one would believe him. There was too much evidence, and that's when he decided to run. He admitted that he had originally planned to hide in Mexico using fake documents and connections, but realized that this was only a temporary solution. As the interrogation continued, detectives realized that Robert was acting out of passion. He was broken not only by the affair, but also by the thought that his future family had been destroyed. His eyes were filled with pain and despair, and he did not try to justify himself. He knew that his fate was already sealed. In the following days, Robert Hills's case went to trial. Carter and Miller gathered all the evidence and proof to prove his guilt. The defense tried to present him as a victim of an emotional breakdown, but the evidence collected at the crime scene and Robert's own confession left the court no choice. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. His accomplice, who helped with the escape and documents, was never found. When the sentence was handed down, Carter and Miller stood in the courtroom, watching Robert being taken away. Carter sighed. It was predictable. When personal feelings cross the boundaries of reason, the consequences are always dire. Miller nodded. Too many lives have been ruined because someone failed to control their emotions. Robert Hills's story was a reminder of how jealousy and resentment can destroy even the most stable of lives. But for Sarah and James, it was just one more case, closed with a sense of accomplishment.